so I thought I would maybe um, change up the routine <laughs> of um, mainly looking at one discourse and that being the topic I thought it would be interesting to explore a topic in particular which is Nibbana and what that is actually where what is the definition of Nibbana and what are the instances where we find that in the suttas and all these different angles and perspectives on what Nibbana is so that um, hearing about it more we can also understand better the direction the imprint on the mind and um, allow all of that knowledge about what it is that we're practicing for to do that imprint on the mind to actually soak in the mind so that whenever the time is right we have we understand we have the knowledge about what it is what it what the Buddha said about it is more importantly I think perhaps because that was a topic that was interesting to me in, in the first place and most of the things that I talk about is because I was really interested in finding out about it to answer my own questions so and Nibbana what is Nibbana uh, that was one of them because that really struck my curiosity when I first got the whole canon well the whole suttas the whole uh, discourses the basket of discourses and I opened up the Diga Nikaya because I didn't know where to start <laughs> I, had, I had no idea okay now I have the canon what do I do with this thing <laughs> you know where do, where do you take it from <laughs> you know where do you start where does it open And then I did a little Google search. And that, that was many years ago. And then I learned that the Diga Nikaya is supposed to be the first one. So the long discourses. That was way before, well, way before. That was a few years before I ordained. Um, And so I opened up the Diga Nikaya and I saw Potapada number nine, states of consciousness. <laughs> That's the first sutta I read. And I have to say that I, I was reading the Dhammapada before and that's really what sold me. That's how I discovered the suttas, was reading the Dhammapada from Bhante, uh, Buddharakita, the founder of Mahabodhi, which was an interesting connection afterwards. Um, <coughs> and I really loved his, uh, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> I really uh, enjoyed his translation and his, um, the Dhammapada most importantly and I to me it was the the best translation that I could find at that time really um, and that really struck my curiosity and then from there I just ordered the whole collection of suttas <laughs> um, by wisdom publications by Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, well, and Maurice Walsh and Yanamoli, Bhante. So, states of consciousness, 
Bodhapada, and then I read that sequence, which I think w we'll start with. And coming from a vipassana, strictly vipassana school, I did not know what these guys were talking about <laughs> because it talked about progressive cessation of perception and sensations and I thought and then they, they he went through the jhanas and it was so beautiful it was so I really resonated with what it was said what it was talked about but I really couldn't relate it to my own practice because I was like, it's like Cantonese to me. It's like, okay, this is really nice, but what do I do with that? Because my meditation instructions are really not explaining me this. So, and that was the beginning of uh, that, that, a bit that quest to understand what is cessation and what is Nibbana. Niroda, because it's in this sutta in particular that the, the well that was my first encounter with and I feel very fortunate that I, that was my first uh, sutta because it to this day I think with all the suttas that I've read which is pretty much all of them not quite but almost I haven't found the sutta that describes how to enter cessation as good as that. So I think that's in this sutta in particular that you can find a practical approach, like step by step, m how it works, like as, f as far as you can make it. There are other suttas in which actually we will uh, explore on, uh, on this session because a little bit different this time. I'm going to go through many, many suttas um, and uh, pick out uh, just that topic from all these suttas. And this is a very long discourse, but we're not going to go through the whole thing at all. We're just going to go right to it. And um, these are all hand-picked, you know, little pieces that have been very helpful to me in my own practice to understand what that is, the end goal, and how it works, and how to enter upon it. And so in this sutta in particular, the question was from Potapada, how does the higher, uh, it's called extinction of perception and feeling, happens, and then the, perce the, the extinction of consciousness but when we say that it sounds really negative <laughs> so we already have to have quite a bit of knowledge to you know understand what we're really dealing with here it's like truly a liberating thing and I'm not gonna try to explain it how it works like at this point we know <laughs> this it's kind of understood that this is a blissful state it's not something to be scared of and in this particular discourse, uh, he, the Buddha explains that it's a progressive, it's a gradual process of letting go, of liberation, through the jhanas, the meditation, the meditative states. And that some, in some jhanas, in some levels of meditation, some perceptions arise like the joy and that's completely normal the mind goes through all of that and it has to because that's just the way it works and then and then in some in all these subsequent levels some perception arise and other perception fade away they cease and that's the extinguishing of these perceptions slowly and that's just another way of saying a gradual liberation process which is such an amazing thing to have this described 
So of course there's a whole big introduction to this, but I'll start with the natural samadhi and how it goes into the first level of meditation. So these five hindrances abandoned, one clearly sees within oneself and relief wells up because because of that relief comes joy. With an uplifted mind, one's body calms down. With a calm body, one experiences ease, and one's happy mind becomes collected. Now here in the Pali, there is no period here. There is it's just a straight line, and it goes right into disengaged from outward desires and detached from unwholesome mental states. You know, there's no break. It's all in one go here. That's the first jhana. Still attended by thinking and reflection with the blissful happiness born of mental detachment or letting go. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. The sensory perceptions that one previously had fade away. All the senses perception not not only perceptions but more like uh, engagement in them at that time there is a subtle but true perception of joy and happiness that comes from letting go then one perceives this subtle but true joy and happiness that comes from letting go in this way, some perceptions arise by practice and some perceptions fade away by practice. And this is that practice. Then Potapada, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified without thinking nor reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. Now the mind starts to gather. One understands and abides the second level of meditation. The perceptions of this subtle but true joy and happiness that comes from letting go that one previously had fades away. That's Niroda. It ceases. The Pali for that is Niroda. So, so that we understand, this is all talking about neuroda, but it's a progressive neuroda. At that time, there is a subtle but true perception of joy and happiness that comes from mental collectedness. Then one perceives this subtle but true joy and happiness that comes from mental collectedness. In this way, some perceptions arise by practice and some perceptions cease, fade away. And that is that practice. With the calming of bliss, abiding in mental steadiness, the calming of stronger joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within one's body. That state which the righteous ones, the Aryas, describe as such steady presence of mind. This is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the first and the third level of meditation. Okay. At that time, there is a subtle but true perception of the bliss of steady awareness. And one perceives this subtle but true perception of bliss of steady awareness in this way some perceptions arise by practice some perceptions cease by practice and this is that practice letting go the notions of happiness and unhappiness with the earlier settling of mental gladness and distractions with neither pain nor pleasure, purified by unmoving presence, one understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. The perceptions of this subtle but true bliss of steady awareness that one previously had fades away. And at that time there is a subtle but true perception beyond pleasant 
and unpleasant perceptions. Then one perceives this subtle but true perception of beyond pleasant and unpleasant. In this way, some perceptions arise by practice, some perceptions cease by practice, and this is that practice. Later, Potapada, having entirely gone beyond all perceptions of form, with the awareness of sensory impact fading away, turning away from the awareness of plurality, aware of endless space, one understands and abides in the plane of endless space. The perception of physical reality that one previously had fades away, it ceases. But it, I use fades away here. That's the tricky part is that I think fade, fades away here is more appropriate because it doesn't completely stop all these things, they just fade away. But the thing is that the word is neuroda, and at the end, it's you kind of want to have the cessation meaning because you want to understand that it just really ceases, like the, the end goal. At that time, the subtle but true perception of endless spaciousness comes to be. Then one perceives this subtle but true plane of endless spaciousness. In this way, some perceptions arise by practice, some perceptions fade away by practice. And that is that practice. Later, Potapada, having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless space, aware of endless consciousness, one understands and abides in the plane of endless consciousness. The perceptions of endless spaciousness that one previously had fades away. And at that time, the subtle but true perception of endless consciousness comes to be. Then one perceives this subtle but true endless consciousness. In this way, some perceptions arise by practice, some perceptions fade away by practice. And this is that practice. Having gone entirely beyond the awareness of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, one understands and abides in the plane of bare awareness, nothingness. The perceptions of endless consciousness that one previously had fade away. And at that time, the perception of subtle but true bare awareness comes to be. Then one perceives this subtle but true perception of bare awareness or nothingness. In this way some perceptions arise by practice and some perceptions fade away by practice. And that is that practice. And see every level is a little bit more subtle. So it's Sometimes it takes a bit of practice to really distinguish them, uh, especially at the beginning, because they're a bit hard to conceive, but we really just have to let go for a long time, and then it becomes this, the subtlety kind of, there is a, enough awareness growing that we understand kind of what actually these states are all about. And see here, he is not talking about the plane between awareness and its limit. Neither perception or non-perception here is skipped entirely. So that's another interesting piece of information that tells us that you know, these states, they're, they're a gradual happening, you know, they're not clear cut, you know, one completely stops and the other one just kicks in all of a sudden. It's really subtle and we have to get used to that level of 
understanding. And it goes to directly to the release from experiential awareness. And that's how I call it here. Up to here, Potapada, one is conscious of oneself. And gradually, one stage after the other, one contacts the beginning of perception, understanding, or the summit of perception. Mental activity is worse for me. Freedom from mental activity is better. If I were to incline and engage my mind in any way, these perceptions would fade and gro gross perceptions would be seen to arise. Therefore, one does not incline nor engage one's mind in any way. When one does not incline nor forces one's mind, then uninclined and disengaged, those perceptions fade away, and gross perceptions are not seen to arise. one enters cessation. This is how Potapada, the complete release from perceptual awareness, is understood and experienced gradually. So here, it's probably one of the clearest definitions of how to, <laughs> how to enter that state. And at that point, it's really just anything that arises is just seen with the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths, in, in fact, in other suttas, the, the Buddha just breaks it down into two. You know, it's seeing the distraction and letting it go. <laughs> that's it. You know, that's the Four Noble Truths. If we, you know, boil it down to the essential. <laughs> And so, at that point, the distraction is any kind of little movement of the mind, any kind of, you know, there is this very clear awareness of nothing. And then the mind starts to begin to incline towards something, and the movement is seen, and that's seen as a disturbance at this point. Um, and then as, as this kind of very, very subtle disturbance is let go of, then there is the awareness becomes so purified that there is a start of a, a loss of a kind of a the sense of presence even when i when i first read that i i was very um inspired because i never knew that was the buddhist teaching you know i knew like oh nir nirvana you know like oh it's like the the thing uh <laughs> in buddhism even though my meditation instructions were really not explaining too much what that was <laughs> But uh, when I read that, I thought, like I never read about Neroda, about cessation, and I didn't know what it was. And um, when I read that, I was very, very much impressed of what the Buddha was actually teaching. The Buddha is not actually teaching mindfulness. He's actually teaching the way beyond mindfulness complete release from perceptual awareness that is something that mm, not a lot of people know unfortunately and so in one of the ways when I started um, trying to find what is there a definition that we can find in the suttas um, that comes back more often or like what comes around that topic, Nibbana? And one of the stock 
sequences that we find in the canon is etang santang etang panirang yadira sabba sankara samato sabhupadi patinisago tanha kayo viraga nirodo nibbanam and what that means is etang santang e, this is peaceful santas santi shanti peace etang this this is peaceful etang panidang this is sublime this is blissful etang santang etang panidang This is peaceful, this is blissful, sublime. Yadidang sabba sankara samato. Yadidang, that is to say, sabba sankara, all sankaras, all activities, mainly mental activities. But physical activities are just even grosser so of course that means <laughs> the activities also so sabba uh, sankara samato samata we're familiar with that settling down Samat, that this sense of um, tranquility when it's tranquilized sabupadi when all when all processes when all activities of the mind are calmed down completely samato and that's another place where we find the word samata sabupadi patinisago sabupadi all acquisitions sabba upadi upadi is taking on taking on things it's very close to upadana upadana which is what we call clinging which i call accumulating repetition clinging usually it's called sabupadi the all all sabupadi um, all acquisitions patinisago in Pali the verb is always at the end so uh, giving up patinisago nisaga is like independence pati is breaking out of it and breaking out of that dependence of the of the acquisitions of that clinging like breaking clinging breaking attachments breaking free sabupadi patinisago tanha kayo tanha tanha is craving that's when we say craving that's the word tanha tanha although literally means thirst interestingly it's it's really interesting to know these things because then we can have a different you know the, the actual meaning of that what it is it's actually not really craving it's thirst like always thirsting for s something for all these things and that's also helping us understand <coughs> Nibbana's quenching. Because that's what Nibbana means. <coughs> quenching the thirst. <laughs> tanha, tanha kayo. Kayo is what is, when you hear destruction <laughs> in, the, in the suttas, that's that's. Kaya, asava kaya, uh, the mental distractions, the mental effluence, the influxes, the mental movements, the asavas. Kaya is like the destruction of the taints. That's what, that's what it is. Tanha kaya is the quen quenching of the thirst or the breaking of the thirst and destruction withering virago and virago is often translated as dispassion because raga raga is 
it's been translated as passion and uh, I, I think that is from a very uh, old you know um, because these first translators they took a lot of words from their religion context which was in England at that time and passion was one of the ways the word ra raga was it's translated. Raga is also translated as lust. See, we see the same influences. Um, it can also be just uh, agitation and also riraga, this passion, because that's how they've been translating raga's passion i'm not a big fan of that word because when i say that people like they become dispassionate <laughs> like it's not it's not a good thing like in our context like it's not seen as a as a good thing for us it wasn't for me like being dispassionate was like I don't know, not wanting to live kind of thing, you know, that kind of stuff it's associated with like very negative uh, context. But interestingly, v uh, viraga can also be translated as calming down. Viraga, like vi raga, if we translate raga as agitation or you know that that wanting that that unsettling unsettled mind and then we raga is the op in this context is kind of the opposite so it's the calming down calm, calming down of that which for me makes just more sense it's more applicable to me so that's how i translate it um Viraga, Nirodo, Nirodo, here we have the end, uh, it, it stops. In, in the early translations, which I, f I found quite, quite uh, interesting, they use the word stopping instead of cessation. It just stops, <laughs> which is another angle, which is quite interesting. Uh, nibbana, then Nibbana... What does it mean? <laughs> what does the word Nibbana mean? Nibbana was, uh, in fact, the word Nibbana means the putting out, the extinguishing of a fire. That's what, because Ni, Ni is that out. It's like putting out, need Wa, wa is wa, blowing, blowing out, it's a blowing out. So that's the literal translation. Of fire, the fire of defilements. <laughs> and fire is agi in Pali. Wa is to blow. Wana is the blowing out, Nibbana. So the quenching, the quelling, the cooling, the blowing out, the putting out of the fire. And here we, we see that Nirodo, Nibbana, they come together. They're synonyms. So they're very, 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 very close. They're almost the same thing. And we have also Viraga, which is in the same line. Uh, so it's just the... And that is the main description that we find in this, the sutta. Etang santang etang panirang yadidang sabba sankara samato sabupadi patinisago tanhakayo virago nirodo nibbana and even uh, Bhikkhu Nyanananda has made a whole list of talks and 
which he's got books on it and that's how we start his series is with that exact definition of Nibbana it's a series of talks on Nibbana and there's books on it it's quite good actually and so this can be uh, it, it is found in many many discourses where the Buddha will even it seems like it is an object of meditation at a certain level where the basics have been understood and the person is in the higher training which means they've entered the stream and that just means you know they've understood the Dhamma just, that's it they've understood to a certain extent the Dhamma they, they're living it they understand um, to a, a certain extent and so uh, and especially in the meditation practice and then this this Nibbana kind of it becomes the object of the mind because of the when people have experienced it to even if they were simply in the vicinity of Nibbana of Niroda for a little bit of time they know what it feels like they know the imprint on the mind and they remember to call that up in the mind and when a person has that mental impression in the mind it's easy it becomes the meditation becomes very easy because all these steps they've all been seen and they've all been gone beyond and when, when that becomes clear and the, 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 the Buddha uses that as an actual object of meditation in many discourses and I think I might have enough time in this retreat to maybe touch upon a few of them uh, in the Maha Malunkya Sutta, it comes back every single jhana. He says uh, the first jhana, and then he says one sees this is peaceful, this is sublime. Blah, blah. So um, it's something that is very used. And so to know this is quite, it's probably the closest definition of Nibbana we can have. And knowing the Potapada Sutta uh, is also bringing us very close to understanding how that state works. You know, when he says, like, if I were to incline or engage my mind or force my mind in any kind of way, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's just that inclination itself. Then it would be a disturbance. It would be a distraction. And at that point, a person knows inwardly inside them that it feels actually better, more liberating to, to be without inclinations, to be without forcing the mind. And that's just a very wonderful place to be in. And continuing with the jhana, since we're a little bit on this, uh, there is this uh, discourse here in the Book of Nines, because there is nine jhana, <laughs> nine jhana attainments, and the Book of Nines is mainly talking about that, <laughs> because that's just the thing that's most talked about that has nine points. So from first jhana all the way up to Niroda. And I, I'm really going to go briefly over this, but it's simply just to point out that um, some, some, some person asked, uh, it is said, friend, directly visible Nibbana, directly visible Nibbana. In what way has the Blessed One spoken of directly visible Nibbana? So, just to for us to understand a bit clearer what what is meant by nibbana here friends secluded from sensual pleasures <laughs> a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the first jhana to this extent too the blessed one has spoken of directly visible nibbana first jhana second jhana third jhana fourth jhana 
all jhanas up to by the complete surmounting oh and the, e even the arupa jhanas the formless by completely surmounting the base of neither perception or non-perception a monk enters and dwells in the cessation of perception and feeling having seen with wisdom interesting because at that point is there a seeing but here is another really interesting piece of information that tells us when it, having seen with wisdom this whole path we've been seeing distractions what is troubling the mind and we've been letting it go but now it's the culmination so having seen with wisdom his stains are utterly destroyed his distractions are utterly stilled to this extent, friend, the Blessed One has spoken of directly visible Nibbana in a non-provisional sense. All the other ones are provisional, temporary, um, or incomplete. They are part of it, they're not complete, but the Niroda, he's, it's said here, it's written, <laughs> that it's uh, Nibbana, directly visible in a non-provisional sense. It's the complete Nibbana. It's not just incomplete. <laughs> so, uh, that also tells us that there's two kinds of Nibbana, and there's other suttas on this, but there's, there's a more um, provisional, temporary Nibbana, incomplete, mundane Nibbana, which happens every time we have a distraction, we see it with wisdom, we let it go. That can be anything, but just that, and there's joy arising, that's Nibbana. And the, the further we go, the better it gets. So, <laughs> Uh, and that's just the way it is and if it's not like that that means something is wrong something is off because it's supposed to be better and better why would the Buddha teach something that's less good in the end than what it was just before <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> it's been going like better and better this whole time and then oh no that last step <laughs> no that means something is not something's not right uh, so that means there's either it needs a little bit more joy to actually keep keep it going, keep awareness going until aw awareness will let you know <laughs> when it's got enough joy. <laughs> it's gonna be like, oh, I'm good, you know. I'm just like. <laughs> so we don't. It's not something that we choose to. Okay, now I should try to enter nibbana and stop being <laughs> joyful. <laughs> no, no, no. no. That's not how it works at all. <laughs> you won't notice the bliss goes away. <laughs> you just actually it doesn't work like that. And another place we find interesting information is in uh, uh, either the Chula Vedala, the shorter uh, series of questions in the Majjhima Nikaya, in the middle length, it's 43 or in the Kamabu Sutta, which is very uh, similar, a little bit shorter, and it only touches upon that cessation. Um, and Chitta asks the Venerable Kamabu these questions. Bhante, how many kinds of conditioned processes are there or built-in processes the activities sankharas there are three kinds of built-in processes householder processes of body processes of speech processes of mind sadhu bhante satchitta 
and having accepted and rejoiced, he asked another question. Bhante, what are the processes of body? What are the processes of speech? What are the processes of mind? Breathing in and breathing out are the processes of the body. Thinking and reflecting are the processes of speech. Perception and felt experience or sensations are the processes of mind. Sadhu Bhante, said Chitta, and asked another question. Bhante, why is breathing in and breathing out the processes of body? Why is thinking and reflecting the processes of the mind? Why are perceptions and sensations the processes of mind? Thinking and reflecting the processes of speech. Breathing in and breathing out, this is bodily. These things are bound up with the body. Therefore, breathing in and breathing out are processes of the body. Having first thought and reflected, householder, then one breaks into speech. Therefore, thinking and reflection are the processes of speech. Perception and sensations belong to the mind. These things are bound up with the mind. Therefore, perception and sensations are the built-in processes of mind. Sadhu Bhante Satchitta, having accepted and rejoiced, he asked another question. Bhante, how can the release from perceptual awareness be experienced? And now we're getting to it. When one enters upon the release from perceptual awareness, one does not think, I will enter the release from perceptual awareness. I am entering the release from perceptual awareness. Or I am in the release from perceptual awareness. But somebody doesn't think that. Rather, it is because one has previously cultivated one's mind in the appropriate way that it leads one to that state. So it's like that momentum. We don't actually, there's no thinking about it. There's no doing it. It's actually, we know how to cultivate the mind so that it just goes there. And how is that? Just letting go. <laughs> Sadhu Bhante Satchita, having accepted and rejoiced, he asked another question. Bhante, when one is entering the release from perceptual awareness, which thing seizes first? The processes of body, speech, or of mind? When one is entering the release from perceptual awareness, the processes of speech fade away first. The processes of body, then the processes of body, then the processes of mind. Sadhu Bhante Satchitta, and he asked another question. What is the difference, Bhante, between one who is dead and gone and one who has entered the release from perceptual awareness? Chitta, in one who is dead and gone, the bodily processes are discon discontinued, completely calmed. The verbal processes are discontinued and completely calmed. And the mental processes are discontinued and completely calmed. Their vitality is completely gone. Their heat is dissipated and their faculties are broken. But for one who has entered the release from perceptual awareness, the bodily activities or processes are also discontinued and completely calmed. The verbal activities or processes are also discontinued and completely calmed. The mental processes are also discontinued and completely calmed. But their vitality continues, their heat has not dissipated, 
and their faculties are pure and bright. This is the difference, householder. Sadhu Bhante, Satchitta, and having accepted and rejoiced, he asked another question. Bhante, how does one emerge from the release of perceptual awareness? Coming out of the attainment of the release from perceptual awareness, one does not think, I will emerge from the, per the release of perceptual awareness. I am emerging, or I have emerged from the release of perceptual awareness. Rather, it is because one has previously cultivated one's mind in the appropriate way that it leads one to that state. In fact, it's hard to be able to remain in that place. So it's not <laughs> the problem is not coming out. <laughs> the problem is more staying in there because the mind has been cultivated in the other way for so long and it's just so excited all the time it's just agitated, agitated, agitated agitated more processes, more processes they just keep coming up, coming up and even if we're really close to there, or even if somebody enters into that place for a second or two likely that they're going to be pulled out again quite soon not just likely <laughs> that's what will happen so emerging is not really the problem sadhu bhante satchitta having accepted and rejoiced one asked he asked another question bhante while emerging from the release of perceptual awareness what things manifest first bodily verbal or mental processes Householder, when emerging from the release of perceptual awareness, first the mental processes become manifest, then the bodily processes, then the verbal processes. Sadhu Bhante Satchitta. Then he asked, Bhante, when one has emerged from the release of perceptual awareness, how many kinds of contacts impinge on their mind? Householder, when one has emerged from the release of perceptual awareness, three kinds of contacts impinge on their mind. The contact with emptiness, the contact with signlessness, and the contact with undirectedness. So, empty, signless, and undirected. And these three contacts are also one of the closest thing that we have in words to define what Nibbana is. Because now we know that Niroda and Nibbana are synonyms through the definition that we've seen before. And now we learn that these three characteristics, these three contacts, they pretty much define what Nibbana is because but the thing is that when these contacts arise Nibbana is not there anymore <laughs> because there is contact so the processes begin again but these are the qualities of Nibbana and this is quite a profound contemplation emptiness signlessness, undirectedness, or um, desirelessness. That's another way of we can describe the third one, or unapplied. Empty is simply that it is a void. Void, usually people say of a self, Yes. But just void. Just, just empty. And signlessness means there's no, there's no object there. That's how we know. Because everything else 
when there's consciousness there's an object whatever consciousness there is is dependent upon an object because if you don't have an object what are you conscious of <laughs> the finest object is just awareness it's just the sense of being conscious of awareness of the sense of I I am but the more subtle it becomes the more that we let go of all of that and that sense of I drops then consciousness it just blows out like a lamp Nibbana signlessness there is no object so that's that's a, a pretty profound insight that we can get from that and undirected there's no more you know that that's where the development the mental development the chanda you know the very wholesome desire to continue let go let go let go and still there's a movement there's an inclination there's a direction of letting go, letting go, letting go, but at some point the direction becomes no more, undirected. And so that's, that's the imprint that Nibbana leaves on the mind. These are the characteristics we can call upon to remember to use as object of meditation object <laughs> to use as vehicle guiding light foundation sadhu bhante satchitta having accepted and rejoiced he asked another question bhante once emerged uh, out of the release from perceptual awareness what does the mind lean tilt and incline to once emerged from the release from perceptual awareness chitta one's mind leans towards release tilts towards release it inclines towards release and that's why i say that after this Usually when that has made an imprint on the mind, the meditation becomes very effort effortless. Because the mind, it just, the waters turn. It's just, the mind leans to that because it remembers how blissful it is. Now it doesn't want an object. We can, a person could take up a, an object, of course. You could do metta, you can do all these things. Which metas, they're not really objects of meditation. They're just wholesome states that we bring up to cultivate but ultimately the mind it just it just naturally leans toward that so that's when the practice changes Bhante how many things are help are truly helpful for the attainment of Niroda cessation Surely, householder, that which should have been asked first, you finally ask. But I will still answer you. Chitta. Two things are truly helpful for its attainment. Letting go and seeing clearly. Samatha vipassana. We'll just end with four very uh, short reflections that are found in the Udana, the inspired sayings, the utterances. And this is another place where we find a sequence of four suttas, which are all called Parinibbana and uh, where we can also find a little bit more information what is Nibbana what is that 
Nibbana Dattu, that Nibbana element that the Buddha taught. And it's very short. So it's each of them is like this really like very profound, beautiful statement. And uh, this utterance, they're all like that in here. So thus have I heard at one time the the Blessed One was staying near Sawati in Jeta's Grove, Anatapindika's monastery. On that occasion, the, the Blessed One was instructing, rousing, inspiring, and gladdening the monks with a Dhamma talk, connected with Nibbana. And those monks, being receptive and attentive, collecting their minds, were intent on listening to Dhamma. Then, on realizing its significance, the significance of the moment, the Blessed One uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. There is, monks, that base where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no air, no base consisting of the infinity of space, no base consisting of the infinity of consciousness, no base consisting of nothingness, no base consisting of neither perception nor non-perception. Neither this world, nor another world, nor both. Neither sun, nor moon. Here, monks, I say there is no coming, no going, no staying, no deceasing, no uprising. Not fixed, not movable, it has no support. Just this is the end of trouble. So this is the ayatana, that base. And sometimes people think Nibbana is just a made-up concept that doesn't actually exist. We have all kinds of schools of thoughts out there that um, say all kinds of things about Nibbana. But this is a place where we can find that actually, you know, it is something and it is a base and it is, it does exist and it's beyond all of these jhanas. It's beyond, beyond all of that which is material, beyond concepts, beyond all of that. But it does exist. <laughs> it's not a myth because <laughs> sometimes people and the problem is that if you don't think it exists you'll never get there that's the thing it's the biggest hindrance so <laughs> so the Buddha is actually that's why he says the door of the deathless is open monks he's actually opening up the door because otherwise it's so hard to see who would figure this out you know, on their own At one time, the Lord was the Blessed One was staying near Sawati in Jada's Grove and Atapindika's monastery. On that occasion, the Blessed One was instructing the monks with a Dhamma talk connected with Nibbana. And those monks were intent on listening to Dhamma. Then, on realizing the significance of the moment, the Blessed One uttered, uttered this inspired utterance. The uninclined is hard to see. The truth is not easy to see. Craving is penetrated by one who knows. For one who sees, there is nothing. Then again, it's the same 
little short introduction and he says then on realizing this the significance of the moment the blessed one uttered this inspired utterance this is the third one there is monks a not born a not brought to being a not made a not conditioned some translated some translations they translate this as an unborn an unbrought into being an unmade unconditioned if monks there were no unborn n no brought not brought into being unmade unconditioned no escape would be discerned from what is born what is brought into being made and conditioned but since there is an unborn an unbrought into being an unmade uncreated unconditioned therefore an escape is discerned from what is born brought into being made and conditioned that's another very profound statement the Buddha really makes it clear it's like see there's and he also says if if it didn't exist I wouldn't be here talking to you <laughs> so that's quite simple I mean if he was to just teach that it doesn't exist he wouldn't teach it. then on realizing the significance of the moment the Blessed One uttered this inspired utterance for the dependent there is instability for the independent there is no instability when there is no instability there is serenity when there is serenity there is no inclination when there is no inclination there is no coming and going when there is no coming and going, there is no disease and uprising. When there is no disease and uprising, there is neither here nor beyond, nor in between the two. Just this is the end of trouble. And this is quite wonderful because we can bring to mind that it's he was standing there giving a talk on Nibbana but then he felt that this was the right moment to express that statement that utterance that inspired saying where he actually made that that drove that point in you know where their minds were ready to take it in they were ready to understand Nibbana understand what it was he's just saying I'm telling you monks it does exist so on this is quite share our merits dukkha patta jani dukkha bhaya patta jani bhaya sokha patta jani sokha hontu sabbe pipani no idang no punyang sabbe satta numodantu sabba sampatti siddhiya aga satta chabu matta Devanaga Mahidika Punyang Tang Anumoritva Chirang Rakant Buddha Sasana. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasana. Sah.